welcome to the Rose Cut webinar uh, series. Um, this is uh, almost a monthly event where we invite all sorts of uh, experts that is related to um, private clients um, and uh, their life to help us to understand um, better what they could be doing. Uh, last time we talked about uh, private education and what people could help themselves uh, with the economic uh, vol volatility. And today we have global migration experts from Henny and Partners here with us today. Um, let's welcome Yawan and Stuart. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and uh, would you like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, so my name's Stuart. Uh, I am the managing partner of the London office. I've uh, been with Henny around six years. Um, I was also in charge of our Nigeria operations. Uh, so that takes me across the planet to uh, various different locations across Africa as well. Um, and we're very much look forward to, to speaking with you today. Hi, my name is Yetuan. I'm an associate director at Henny and Partners in the London office as well. Um, I am a client advisor, which means that my role is essentially to talk to private clients, the families um, and the representatives about what are the options for them when it comes to citizenship and residence by investment. Um, and yeah, explaining the process and helping them along the way. Great, thank you both. And for those who um, didn't know me, uh, myself is Chaoja, or Q for short. Uh, I used to work in big private banks and then decided that I could uh, provide more efficiency and more bespoke service to uh, people um, by starting my own fintech business, Rosecut. Um, so we are a digital private bank, which does pretty much the same thing as private banks, but uh, exist on the website and mobile apps and make the account opening as well as investment management much more uh, smooth and uh, efficient uh, for you. Uh, so let's kick start today. Uh, a bit of admin, um, please do drop in your questions into the Q&A function or chat along the way. Uh, we will have about 45 minutes presentation and then I'll answer you questions uh, towards the end. Uh, there will be also a poll to understand how you like today's uh, today's uh, webinar and if there's any other topics you would like to explore. So risk warnings because of our investment business that the value of investment can go up and down and uh, you are taking essentially risk for the potential uh, return and past performance is no guarantee of future performance. Uh, quick one. Uh, so today's topic of exploring new frontiers uh, comes at uh, a time where people are worried about, you know, their home country economy and they want to see what other options and together with the benefit of realizing actually you can do a lot of um, things um, from a remote uh, setup you know, employers and um, are much more, you know, flexible on this compared to just uh, three years ago. And some of our audiences, you know, are uh, wealthy entrepreneurs in certain countries where they want to explore, you know, what other options I could be having. Uh, I could, re you know, move my own uh, family or I can move part of my team. Uh, so the Henny and Partners uh, expert here can talk through, talk you through the motivations and different citizenships and um, and what are the best programs. So it's essentially of you know having a bit more research before you make an informed decision rather than what we talked about the past dependency. Okay, my friends did this, therefore, therefore I should do that, which may not be suitable the best or optimal uh, option for you. And another thing is that we understand some entrepreneurs think, okay, I can just move somewhere and try um, with a tourist visa or with you know my passport. I just learned something from that one uh, that my British passport is less valuable and does not actually allow me to automatically to move to Portugal to work. So, you know, I need a solution myself if I'm thinking about going somewhere else. So we already have a customer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, hopefully you will find this content uh, interesting and how to do things in a, in a more informed, uh, informed uh, manner. 
Um, here uh, we will have a quick intro on Henley and Partners. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, Henley and Partners is now approaching 30 years old. The, the Effectively, the concept of residence and citizenship planning was created by Henley and Partners back in the late 90s. Um, we serve internationally mobile entrepreneurs and investors, uh, but what sets us apart uh, predominantly from our so-called competitors is the fact that we actually have a government advisory board. So what does that mean? That means that we actually uh, help governments set up, uh, implement and run their citizenship or residency programs across the world. We've been responsible for doing this for a number of the world's leading uh, migration programs. So um, we now are 39 offices worldwide. We are about 400 staff. Uh, like I said, I mean, this slide's slightly old. We're approaching 30 years uh, of, of leading the industry. We have now 34 programs available. So there is something for, for everyone. You know, these prices range dramatically, but that we have a program that could suit most high net worth individuals. Uh, and, and the actual work we've done on the government advisory side has raised over $8 billion uh, for countries in question. And this is really, really important. You know, lots of people... Uh, see this as, as a controversial industry, which, which probably comes from a lack of understanding, um, but this really is beneficial. You know, at Malta as such, um, with the program we designed in Malta, was one of the jewels in our crown, and it's actually helped Malta survive COVID. Um, it's raised a huge amount of money for them, and each and every one of the investors, that, which you may well become, actually do benefit the country in question as well. So it's a win-win for both client and, and government. That's a very interesting point, Sue, that you just raised, because I think, um, you know, we talked about borderless investments for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of that, if ourselves could be borderless and explore sort of freedom mm -hmm. more than before, that, that's really beneficial. That's essentially how what it runs the capital market and the world economy, right? Absolutely. So... Why? I mean, what do we do? So effectively, we see clients through the entire process of obtaining them an additional or alternative citizenship or residence. It's, as, it's quite as simple as that. Why would someone, why would you be looking to obtain an, an additional citizenship or residency? Now, the, the numbers are, the, the, sorry, the reasonings behind that are, are vast. And each and every one of our clients has their own reasonings for it. But here we have a few uh, examples as to why they would do this. So um, it's visa-free travel is a, is a, is a, is a predominant uh, sort of reasoning we hear from our clients. You know, some of our clients come from countries where they can travel to 30 countries globally without the need for a visa. A small uh, investment or donation to a certain country can increase that to 150 countries on average and can go as high as 190. So uh, as you can see, it takes significant amounts of time to obtain visas. Um, some countries only offer single entry visas. Access to other passports may be crucial, such as times of civil unrest, political instability. You know, we've all seen what's happening across the world at the moment. Having an additional residency or citizenship can be priceless. Uh, and, and I genuinely do really mean that. So citizenship from a small, peaceful country is considered as, some, as a form of protection when traveling as well. High net worth individuals consider alternative citizenship and passport as the best life insurance you can buy. And, and we was, I was speaking with a life insurance company recently. And we actually said we would do great work together because what we're offering is, is, is an insurance for, in both <laughs> ways. Yeah, it, there's no question about it. Uh, investment in future. Acquiring a second citizenship can be an investment for the future and allow the applicant, along with his family, to enjoy all the benefits. So we have people from countries where they are persecuted purely because of where they were born. No one on this planet can choose where they are born. Uh, I consider myself to have won the passport lottery, so to speak, because I automatically obtained the British passport. Some people very much don't win the lottery and they are persecuted because of where they were born. So this allows them legitimately, and if they're a fit and proper person, to obtain an additional passport, um, but it doesn't make them any less loyal to the country in which they were born. They can maintain that residency or citizenship should the country allow. 
to renounce citizenship, an individual must first obtain another. So this gives you another option. You know, lots of people wish to no longer be associated with the country in question, and this allows them to be able to do that as well. So citizenship by investment and residency by investment are obviously very different. So the citizenship by investment term describes the policies of a country in which a foreign person may gain citizenship through significant capital contributions to the countries. Uh, put it in very simple terms, you make an investment in that country, if you're a fit and proper person, they will in exchange, pass, having passed all the rigorous due diligence processes, you will obtain a citizenship to that country. Uh, the next one is residency by investment. This term describes the policies of countries that grant foreign persons a residence permit through capital contributions to the country. So this is obviously slightly different. You don't obtain a citizenship, you don't obtain a passport, but it gives that person the ability to spend effectively as much time as they wish in that country or have a base outside of their naturalised country of birth. Uh, so quick question sure. here, if, for example, the UK program we will cover uh, later on as an update, you can obtain the residence by investment, mm -hmm. and then you can obtain citizenship if you meet additional requirement. Yeah. Yeah. So do you help people to strategize on both? Yeah, so I mean, each program has their own rules. We have citizenship programs that go straight to passport. We have some that are residents which can lead to citizenship. We will advise them on every single aspect of it. Some of them will never really lead to citizenship, but we, we can address that and we'll take them through the entire process and guide them as to which one will be the best for them, depending on what their criteria is. Great. Um, we've kind of discussed that. Those are the differences. Um, citizenship in a more technical term allows you to vote, uh, can be passed to future generations, allows obviously international travel via, that, via that, that little book that you get, which is known as the passport, <laughs> affords protection from the state. Residence grants you the ability to live, work, travel and study in said country. Uh, usually comes with conditions or requirements, may give some extra travel rights, like for example, you obtain Portugal, you get that kind of Schengen movement, mm -hmm. um, can be withdrawn and is likely to affect tax status should someone want to go and spend you know, all of their time or significant time in that country. Yeah, so what we typically see is a lot of people did not uh, understand enough about the impact on tax status. And then, you know, as their investment managers, we end up working with their tax advisors and a lot of firefighting yeah. after yeah. events. Yeah. And so we will cover some part of that. And uh, this later. is why we like partnering with firms like you who can guide them on those things as well, which is great. Yeah. Next slide shows uh, some of them, like I mentioned at the start, we have over 30, I think it's 34 now. Um, this may not be completely up to date. We have 34 programs available globally. So right across from Canada, Panama, the US um, in the West, right across to Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand in the East, and even as far down as Australia and New Zealand, they have some, some really unique, fantastic products available. Where do we see the most interest? Um, Lots of people have the desire to get an EU citizenship. So we look at Austria, Malta, and maybe Portugal via the residence routes, so which can lead to citizenship. Greece is also popular. Uh, Montenegro, incredibly popular, especially from certain regions. In the Caribbean, we have the passport programs down there on the bottom left. Antigua, hugely popular. St. Kitts. St. Kitts has been around since 1984. It's, the, uh, it, it's a little bit younger than me. It's, a, <laughs> it's, the, it's the leading citizen, it's the longest serving citizenship program available and still hugely popular right across the planet. Uh, everyone from, from multiple countries have, have, have been interested in that program. We have actually served uh, people from 160 different countries. Um, so we are very well versed in assisting people from all over the world. Oh, um, just curious, uh, what about Belize? Is there still a program available? Some of the Chinese billionaires uh, took advantage of that program in the 90s or early 2000s. So there are just under 100 programs globally. Uh, we offer 30 odd. We feel we have a sort of a, a huge legal team that would uh, embark on researching certain programs and making sure that what programs we offer are, are we are comfortable in offering. So Jordan. Belize is not on that <laughs> list currently, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not it's not good. But these are the ones that we have currently. 
That's a very helpful um, <laughs> explanation because you actually have done your due diligence. Absolutely. Uh, which programs you would like to offer. I'll give you another example on that. So we had so many clients coming to us saying they wanted to do Vanuatu. Vanuatu has a citizenship program. It's down here somewhere. Uh -huh. um, we <laughs> never felt our legal team, our government advisory board, never felt entirely comfortable with how Vanuatu run the program. Mm. The EU consistently warned Vanuatu about the running of the program. Uh, they did nothing about it. And so lately they withdrew the EU travel status from Vanuatu passport holders meaning that the people who did Vanuatu are now have yeah. a product which is not worth what they thought it was going to be worth. And this is another kind of point to Henley and Partners in that we just didn't feel comfortable offering that program. We want to make sure that we do things the right way and we are very, very diligent in what we offer and what we don't. That's a great point. There is actually different qualities in the citizenship program yeah. and residency programs and you want to buy into, you want to get into the high quality exactly. one. Right. That's yes. going to hold its value yeah. after your investment. It's very similar to what we do as wealth managers. We want to, you know, we, we spend a lot of time researching the different investment products and only provide a mandate that's made of quality mm -hmm. uh, investment products. Yeah. Because when we care about long term relationship with clients, like we, we don't want to be in a position of sort of suggesting something or putting something on our shelves that, yeah. that we, we are not certain about. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Vanuatu, since um, the EU basically now that Vanuatu citizens don't have visa free travel access to all the EU countries anymore, mm -hmm. um, there are quite a few Chinese families because Vanuatu was very heavily promoted in China for a while. Um, and, and they would say that, you know, I have my Chinese passport and maybe my Vanuatu citizenship. Uh, I don't really know what to do now because now I don't have a visa to travel to mm. Europe. Can you help? Yeah, so, so they have to get a new citizenship. Or, or another residence <laughs> permit, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and seeing sort of what are the good options for them, how it works and so on. Yeah. Wow, not easy. Um, just so that I don't send anyone to sleep, I'm going to hand over to Yakvan. But before, <laughs> before I do, I just wanted to let you know that we... We are very much used to dealing with people from all over the planet, and we are always happy to have explanatory conversations. We never charge for our initial meetings. We are more than happy to speak and discuss all of the various options. Um, and what we're doing here doesn't make you any less loyal to the country in question. I often get told that, you know, why would I want another citizenship? I love my country. We're not asking you to not. This is just giving you another option. So um, it's it's something that is very popular within the high net worth community now, and it really is hugely important, as important as as, as sort of succession planning, uh, and, and very much a hot topic. So we'd be delighted to speak with anyone who has any interest in it. But I'll hand over to Yama so that she can take you through a little bit more of the options. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, so in front of you, you might see a slide with lots of numbers, not sure how clear you can see it on your screens, um, but essentially this is a comparison chart or a simplified comparison chart of the leading citizenship by investment programs. When we say citizenship, of course, referring to what um, Stu was talking about, it means at the end of the application process, shall you choose one of these countries, the end result will be a citizenship certificate, essentially, and passport. So the range is, is large. So on the higher end, you would have, you know, Austria, 3 million or 8 million euros investment, Malta is over 1 million euro. And then for the Caribbean countries, um, on the other end of the scale, it would be, you know, around 100, 150, 200,000 US dollars. So therefore, there really is something for everyone. But of course, when it comes to the question of which one suits me, and my family that is the sort of conversation that we have on the with our clients on a daily basis so it depends on various things like how soon does someone want a citizenship what is the objective of of doing so is it more for visa free travel or is it for you know relocation in the future or is it for like they, they want to make sure that they have an eu passport or in some cases now um you know let's say if a, if a client is from a country where there is unrest um, or war going on, um, then they would ask that, you know, which one is the one that I can get the fastest, or, you know, sometimes recently with the Russian Ukraine situation, there are restrictions that are placed on, for example, Russian and Belarusian nationals. And then so the conversations with those um, clients is more like what is available to me now, 
Mm. And and sometimes these kind of you know we would talk to a client for maybe some months and some some in some some cases some years already and and we would always say like you know it's it's time to act now think in advance try to get it planned because it's not something that you know even the fast processing it cannot really be for the Caribbean it's three to six months or for Austria it's two to three years so you, wow. you can't really just get it tomorrow mm. Mm. and when you if you wait until when something is maybe not ideal in your home country and then you come and say like can I get a passport right away or can I get a citizenship right away that's just it just doesn't work it's like probably that. too late by then yeah yeah so so that's that's um yeah so these are just some of the some of the programs that are available for the citizenship side and of course not every client wants another citizenship because maybe their home country doesn't allow it or maybe they don't need it urgently like let's say if they're um original passports by birth is, is, is you know, they're, they're not in a rush to do so. Then on the next slide, you will see the residence option. Um, so residence by investment options on the top part of the chart, that's the European programs. Um, that's in the media, people refer them to as the golden visas of the various European countries. Um, the investment there also ranges from anything from 250,000 euros to, to 500, 1 million euros, it depends. Um, and then there are also a bunch of other jurisdictions around the world, like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so forth. Um, most of the, you know, when, when it comes to a conversation of, of which one is suitable for me, then it also sometimes will be, we'll ask questions like, do you require, are you look, actually looking to relocate? Do you plan to spend X number of days per year over in, in that jurisdiction. Um, and there is a lot of conversations. Sometimes they will ask, uh, clients will ask about, you know, the lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, of course, tax implications, and when, if they decide to relocate and make that make that place their primary residence. So there, some, some jurisdiction will say that, you know, in order to get the residence permit and to maintain it, you actually need to live there. Mm -hmm. So for Switzerland, for example, you have to live there. It is possible to um, have a lump sum tax arrangement with the canton and go and live there, but then you will become a tax resident of Switzerland. Um, that's the same with Austrian citizen uh, residency. But some of the jurisdictions, you are not required to live there. You can keep that permit, mm -hmm. and then that permit is you can you know you can live wherever you are living or wherever you want. But then that permit will allow you to live there when and if you want to, mm -hmm. as long as the investment is still there. You can go there whenever you want. So, so it really is is then a conversation of what it is that that the client wants. And we in the UK, um, we know that maybe some some of the members of the audience are interested in the UK. For the UK, um, it, the expectation is is that you will move to the UK and make UK your primary residence, especially if the client's goal is to get indefinitely to remain, yeah. um, and that would mean six months. Per year, yeah. <laughs> per year in the UK, and therefore it does have tax implications. Yeah, you need automatically turn into yeah. UK tax visit, and that requires planning upfront and stuff like that. And I noticed that you have yeah. Thailand on your list. Yes. I recently read about it. It sounds very much like you pay for VAP travel access. Yes. Um, it's so, a unique little product, yeah. Thailand. It's very yeah. unique, but very interesting for lots of different people, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so have you have any interest recently? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think when in for Thailand, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are all, all businessmen executives that are sort of in the Southeast Asia area that they feel like you know they go to Thailand regularly already. And, and as you've rightly pointed out, then you know the, the the residence permit allows for various you know VIP access and access to golf course and, and all these things. So um that's one group of people <laughs> that are interested <laughs> in Thailand, but we also likewise we also have a lot of clients from Europe. Um, or you know the US and so on that just think of it as, as sort of like oh it would be good to have a residence permit at a relatively low cost for in, in a part of the world that they like mm, and yes. then they because you don't need to live there right and you can get a five-year permit 10-year permit 20-year permit um that you know how we talked about residents and some of the residents route can lead to a citizenship mm. um, many of them do for the European ones if you live there for Thailand it would not so mm. that's the kind of things that we, we talk to the client and explain but for most clients they, they're not really particularly keen or they, it's not that they must get a Thailand passport but it's more like oh it's great to have this place where mm. they can go to when they need to yeah, yeah as part of the global portfolio of yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's yeah. a really important point we don't have clients just doing one nowadays it used to be we'd do one and they were sorted and we'd never sort of see those clients again but we have now clients from in, from the outset who are signing up to two three four programs globally to diversify their their bases, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. And there is also sort of as time develops, 
uh, as time goes by, they realize there are newer and better options. Yeah. So my personal experience growing up in China was that the first batch of Chinese um, successful entrepreneurs, they started signing up to the Canadian residency yeah. program. Yeah. And uh, without the language capability mm -hmm. or anything to do with Canada, mm -hmm. and they don't even they didn't even appreciate the weather there. So yeah. three months per year was a very difficult uh, task, you know, for yeah. a lot of those families. So I know at least fifty percent of the people around me who signed up to the Canadian program in the nineties dropped out halfway yeah. and then becomes a trend to get a Hong Kong ID yes. or yes. Hong Kong, <laughs> Hong Kong thing. Yeah. And um, that probably was the, the, the same for Chinese people for the last 10, 15 years until about seven, eight years ago when I moved to UK private banking, a lot of my clients were like, actually, I, I feel like Hong Kong is not the optimal insurance anymore i need to move to europe or uk and i'm gonna invest for the uk investor visa and things like that now so as time goes by they they realize that different programs or different uh, needs as their lifestyle or business uh, needs involves and then you know maybe like what you said having a plan to have three four things uh, in the portfolio is is a is a thing they could uh, start thinking about there's no rush to have it done overnight yes. and it's impossible to get it done no. overnight um, but having a conversation and keep the keep the you know ideas uh, explored that that's important um, so we have pro provided a, a list of um, frequent asked questions where you know you guys can jump start and uh, if you have any uh, questions that you want us to the guests to answer live please type in the q a or the chat function either it's fine yes uh so first first one what are the benefit of caribbean citizenship by investment yeah there's so, so many islands yeah <laughs> which one Sometimes the client will ask which which one of the five, like they, what, what are they like? Some some of the clients will have been to all of them. We know they are. My they question will be which is least impacted by the typhoon or any of oh, the hurricanes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and you know, we, we would try to um give the clients a bit of an overview of how they differ from each other. Mm -hmm. And it depends on what the client is looking for as well, because there are certain, like, for example, Grenada. Um, when you are a Grenadian citizen, then after you become a Grenadian citizen, um, it is possible to apply for an E2 visa to live and work and start business in the UK, uh, sorry, in the US, mm. um, <laughs> in the US. Um, and, and therefore some clients have that as a, as a longer term goal. And if that is important to them, then Grenada it is, because then it, it's only Grenada out of the five that offers that. Or some clients would say, it's very important to me to have visa-free access to China. Mm. And if, if it's on the basis of that, then we would say, you know, Dominica has visa free access to China, so does Grenada and not the others. Oh, great. So some of the clients will, however, say that I want to make sure that the country has no visa free access to China. <laughs> <laughs> and if that's the case, then we'll talk about the other ones. Or some of them would say like, oh, I have a friend who has done some kids. Mm. I like, I, I don't really know exactly why I like some kids, but I have many friends who've done it. And then I think that's what, that's what I should go for. So that's what we would. That's their that's social that's like. circle kind of. Yeah. To some yeah. Kids. yeah. yeah. Often yeah. these things comes in trends and waves. Yeah. So we'll find a big batch of certain people doing it from certain countries and they'll all do Antigua. And, but it might not necessarily work. They might want access to the US and therefore they would that's probably right. be guided towards Grenada or they might just want specific access to a certain country and then therefore only that country would work. They're all fairly similar similar and mm -hmm. uh, they're all fairly similarly priced but once you start adding family members etc mm -hmm. it can be mm -hmm. quite uh, the, the difference in costs can be quite big so it's always important to understand the nuances of each one and that's how we would yeah. help and for the Caribbean um, for all of the five countries you would have um, as a basis I guess the, either the non-refundable contribution option mm -hmm. so that's when you make a donation or you can choose to invest in real estate. It's usually government approved real estate. Um, some clients will be happy with one or the other. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes some of the clients will say, I don't want to donate, but neither do I want real estate in the Caribbean because of you know, hurricanes and various yeah. reasons. Then we'll say, for example, we'll be able to say that, you know, St. Lucia has a government bond option. Mm -hmm. Um, and some clients like that because then they're like, well, it's a zero interest bond, mm. but <laughs> but at least like, you know, I don't need to do one or the other. And 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 so yeah. the programs have a lot of um 
I guess um, nuances. they're quite yeah nuances and, and they're quite also innovative and in sort of coming up with different ways of that would be suitable and and it's trying to see competitive what competitive market as well yeah so I guess it's a sort of um, a matchmaking between the family's needs in terms of access yeah. as well as as a choice of investments yeah. and um, potential lifestyle yeah um, as well so uh, an interesting point for the tech entrepreneurs because mm. a lot of them might want to expand into US mm. and US uh, work visa or there is something similar to exceptional talent visa in the UK yeah. is is still very difficult to obtain. I had I had a few friends went through that. So there you go, you have Grenada on the menu. Yeah. If you want to route into US for um, business expansion in the future. And we have many clients doing Grenada purely because they can then get the E2. It's hugely popular. Um, so yeah. as an investment Grenada, manager, I would say you need to do your tax planning way ahead of moving to US. Yeah. And there's also a lot of restrictions. You know, if you don't do it well, it means 30% off um, your net worth. We'll talk about that later. But, you know, so, so these are all trade-offs. And some clients say, you know, well, the US represents such a huge market to me. Even after 30% discount on my net worth, I will be still worth more than if I get stuck in the UK. Okay. And then you make an informed decision. About the UK. <laughs> 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 on that basis. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, great. Um, um, maybe just one more thing about Caribbean. The, one of the other reasons why some clients prefer maybe have Caribbean as one of the citizenship is because they don't you don't need to travel there. At all. Mm. The full process can there. be done remotely, you mm. don't need to spend time there. The process is relatively fast, I would say, usually between three to six months. Mm. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's, you know, maybe a longer term reason might be for the E2 visa with the US, but then, you know, immediately you already enjoy the visa free travel access to UK, Schengen, Europe, yeah. Singapore, Hong Kong. Yeah. So, so it, it's a very effective option. Yeah. Yeah. For Great. <laughs> Good yeah. to know. And uh, European countries, what are we seeing? I'm seeing a lot of Portugal and Malta. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, Malta is a bit of the jewel yeah. in our crown because we designed that program for the Maltese government, but it does represent probably the, the easiest and best route to get EU citizenship. So mm. it's effectively straight to passport. It would take around 18 months. Um, and 18 that gives, months. It gives you an EU citizenship for life. Uh, which obviously gives you the ability to live, work, play in any of the EU member states, which no longer includes the UK. <laughs> which is why we would have British clients that would say, like, you know, I, I'm very interested, you know, they would start to comment on Brexit, and then, and then they would say that, you know, I'm against it. However, now I need to find a solution because I don't have any Irish ancestry or, or anything in my family. So what can you do? Um, and they would also have heard about Portugal, for example, mm. or like, you know, the Greek golden visa, Italy golden visa, Spain and so on. And Portugal is popular because it, there is a potential path to a citizenship under the current naturalization law. But the, the consideration for Portugal is that it takes very long. Yeah. It will take five you know, years. minimum five years of holding the permit, but in essence, because you need time to get to the permit first, mm. you know, currently it's going to be at least eight months, one year before you even get the first permit, and then you hold the permit for five years. And then you still need time to apply for a permanent residence and citizenship, mm -hmm. which means realistically it's going to be six, seven years. Yep. Wow, it's yeah? a long time. And a lot of things can happen in six, seven years. <laughs> so that's therefore, you know, sometimes, you know, if they want it sooner, yeah. then yeah. Malta. It is a, it's, a, it's a kind of a cheaper option to obtain what Malta will give you quite quickly, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So yes. um, it gets you an EU passport at the end of the day, but Malta if we're looking for speed, et cetera, would be the better option yeah. and so, a more defined route. So there is no defined route to citizenship with Portugal. It's yeah. someone making a decision on their five, six years of residency. Yeah. Whereas Malta is, you either fit the bill and make the required monetary donations and investments, or you don't. <laughs> so, you know, we talked about Montenegro. Um, yes, I'm yeah, curious about that. <laughs> I saw the look on your face in you were wondering about that. So Montenegro is um, not currently part of the EU, it's not yet. It's a EU men candidate country. Mm -hmm. So um, it might join the EU as soon as three years. Maybe it's going to be five years. Longer. We don't really know don't exactly. Know. No one knows for sure. However, um, because it is a very strong candidate country, um, a lot of the clients who want a citizenship and which means that they can still enjoy visa-free travel access to Europe and many countries, or, um, then 
for them it's it's a good solution because maybe for Malta because the Malta minimum for a single applicant is just under one million family of one two one point one one point two further than that whereas the Caribbean um, I guess the total cost depending on what you choose is more on the sort of 500 700 thousand euros mark mm. and and Car Montenegro has a real estate component to it which then also some clients prefer because some clients would say that I like real estate investment um, and, and so that's, that could be a good alternative. So if and when Montenegro joins the EU, then as a Montenegro citizen, then you suddenly realize that you have EU citizenship. Yeah. So there's some upside to that investment, yeah. potential upside. But how um, do you look at how new the program is? So for example, Montenegro is a recent program, yes. less than five years old or something. Definitely. And you are comfortable with that, even though it's new. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like we, our government advisory team, um, our legal team, we do due diligence on the programs. Um, there are sort of, I guess, pros and cons also. Some some clients like programs that have existed for a very long time. So mm -hmm. Austria, as a program, has existed since um, 1986. So that's a sort of a very long history path mm -hmm. that has existed. Montenegro indeed is is a recent introduction, and also is a limited time program as well. That the the it is only going to be available until the end of this year. Right. So you can't sort of sit around and wait until next year and come to us and say, yeah, I want to apply for Montenegro yeah. citizenship. So, so, but however, some clients also like that. Some clients feel that, well, you know, oh, that citizenship program is so popular. Therefore, everyone has had that citizenship, you know, maybe one of the Caribbean countries, everyone has that passport. Um, but if it's a limited time program, then that's better because there are fewer, there will be fewer yeah. people going around. They will around be part that. of that select few that yeah. are able to obtain that, that mm. at that time. Limited edition. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One time only. One yeah. time only thing, yeah. So what's the 90, 180 day thing? On Brexit. That, on Brexit. That we need <laughs> I to mean, be... it's not really a rule that is only for the British nationals, but essentially when you are not a um, citizen of an EU country, um, even if you have visa-free travel access to uh, the Schengen area, mm -hmm. so let's say if someone is a UK passport holder, you can, of course, travel to the EU without a visa, right? You can go there as a tourist. Mm. However, the maximum amount of time that you can spend there is 90 days over a 180 days period. And that's a rolling period, which means that every, every day you look back to the past 180 days and in the past 180 days, you shouldn't have stayed more than 90 days. Wow, is this so is it's, very it's, it's very challenging for a lot of clients of ours, British clients who, who have a holiday home in France or Italy or somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then they typically spend two, three months. And also nowadays with remote, remote working, it's great to be able to be there in the it's holiday home, to they work track. there. And then if they have done that, if they've spent the 90 days, if they need to go back to the Schengen area, it's not just one EU country, it's the entire Schengen area. Oh, if they need to go to like, <laughs> they spend time in the home, home in France, but they need to go to Germany for a business trip in, in autumn, then they if they don't have enough days, they simply just cannot go back in until the 180 days. For so what happens if they get rejected at the border? They shouldn't attempt to enter. If they did enter, then they probably, it will probably come up at the border. Or when they exit, then they will say, how many days did you say in the Schengen area? And people sometimes with clients, clients will ask, how do they know? Of course they would know because there is a, yeah, <laughs> there is a border them, enter yeah. and exit the Schengen yeah. area. So yeah. It's a very important point for clients to consider. We're happy to sort of discuss more about that and, and how to yeah, potentially um, help our clients with, with, that, mm -hmm. with that concern. Yeah, so for the Rose client, uh, we notice that they're international, yeah. probably 80% uh, not British, but somehow have some ties to the UK mm -hmm. and 20% British people. Sure. And uh, so, you know, in the tech sector, we have a lot of clients which I'm witnessing a lot of people somehow move to Portugal. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and maybe it's a good time to, to yeah. look into that, you know, what visa am I on? Yes. Am I following the rules strictly yeah. Yeah. Um, before I get carried away of yeah. renting or buying a flat on the beach and go surfing <laughs> after, yeah. after my, my meetings? Yeah. And uh, there's a little bit of boring, you know, <laughs> immigration kind of things we need to take care of, guys. <laughs> it's very important, isn't it? Because, yes. you know, some, uh, some clients, they would think that, oh, you know, I can just move to Portugal and I can just be there. I can just live there. That's what it that's, does. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's only true if you have an EU citizenship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have an Irish passport, then yes, you can go and live in Portugal and register yourself at the town hall. But mm -hmm. otherwise, you need to make sure that you have the right immigration or legal status in order to even be there. Yeah. 
Great. And the next question about uh, eligible investments. So there is, this is very broadly speaking, depending on the program, they are usually, you know, like things like real estate or um, funds investment, venture capital, private equity. Some of them will be a donation. Um, some of them will be, you know, some of them will have government bond option. Some of them will have an option of starting a company in that country and hiring ex number of members of staff. Um, some of them has a combination. So it really depends on, on the client and therefore it's a, always a conversation that, um, that, that we will have with them. But on the note of the company, because I, we know that sometimes, um, especially entrepreneurs will ask, oh, you know, I run a company in the UK or in my home country or wherever it is. And then they say, can I set up a company and therefore be eligible for a visa? For some of the programs, yes, because we are very focused on the private client side. So mm -hmm. we work with clients um, as an individual, as a family, um, and is, as a founder of a, of a company, um, you can indeed, for, for example, for Portugal, for Spain, you can go and start a company and get a visa that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's not for all of them, but happy to discuss if that's what the client wants to do. Understood. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays, especially with certain requirements of the uh, businesses, if they're aiming for IPO, for example, there's certain uh, we set up requirement yeah. and maybe this is a separate discussion from uh, yeah. you know uh, from, from the main business of what you can do with the with the uh, citizenship investment yeah. but I guess this is very based on case by case yes. <laughs> situations yeah Indeed. and uh, the last bit uh, how does tax residency differ from the legal rights side? So sometimes clients would come and say that, um, you know, I want to become a tax resident of another place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first of all, of course, we would say that we're not tax advisors. You need to, you know, we work with, we're happy to work with your tax advisors to try to um, have that uh, specialty advice. Um, but the, I think it's a very common thing to, to it's, it's quite easy for people to mix them up and mm -hmm. get them confused. Mm -hmm. But of course, I think it's just a key thing that we want to mention is that if you are not a legal resident, if you don't have the legal right to reside somewhere, you can't really become a tax resident of that place. So you can't, for example, as a British citizen, just an example, to say that, well, I want to become a tax resident of Malta or Portugal or Monaco, and I just want to be a tax resident there. You can't, as a, on a tourist, as a tourist status, mm -hmm. go and do that. So therefore, we would need to figure out the, the visa part, the residence permit, the citizenship part. And that's the sort of conversation that we're happy to have with the, with the client together with the tax advisor, or if they don't have a tax advisor for that particular jurisdiction, happy to make those introductions and work together as a team to figure out a good solution, depending on what, is trying, what it is that they're trying to do. Great. I think that's really helpful to understand um, because uh, from the investment point of view, uh, there is a lot of regulatory requirement for us to um, ask the client, you know, what's your tax business say? Yeah. Um, 10 years ago, you probably could get away with being a tax nomad, mm -hmm. you know, spending three months at mm -hmm. four different locations and not reporting your tax residency. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's impossible to open an investment account mm -hmm. if you don't declare your tax residency and come with some evidence of it mm -hmm. and so there's much stricter regulatory requirements and uh, honestly if someone is not very transparent on this we would be you know not uh, possible to take them on board mm -hmm. because this has you know very um, deep regulatory applica uh, implications yeah. on, on us as, yeah. a, as a regulated business mm -hmm. so it's important to figure this out very what's your tax residency and how yeah. are you going to work on that and for those that live in the uk you know how there is a, a lot of the i guess um clients or internationals then they're on a non-domicile mm. and and <laughs> so this whole you know change from a non-dom person to a domicile status and then also together often with together with the tax advisor of the client then mm. it's something that you need to plan in advance if you are trying to move yeah. somewhere it takes and, years yeah and so <laughs> it, it's, it's always or, or you know some people do it in advance of a self business um but yeah all sorts of conversations yeah so we will uh, quickly run through the update on the uk uh yeah. so very quickly i guess the nutshell is that um everyone probably knows that the investor visa the two million five million ten million pound route no longer exists as of now has a lot to answer <laughs> <laughs> since february uh, of 2022 um and therefore realistically for someone who is a investor 
um, to want to come to the UK and live in the UK um, because you know, entrepreneur visa as previously how it was doesn't exist anymore. Investor visa doesn't exist anymore. Um, and previously there are, you know, visa types that's for, you know, representative of an overseas business visa. Um, the reality now is that most clients would need to come to the UK on an innovator visa. So the innovator visa is as a very quick summary also, that's when someone um, have a scalable, viable, um, an innovative business idea. Mm. That business idea, the person will get the, apply for the visa. You can include the dependents, so your spouse and children under eighteen years old, um, and then come to the UK, and then you can start the company in the UK. But in order to even be able to uh, uh, be eligible for the visa, um, the client's business idea needs to be endorsed by an endorsing body. Yeah. So our business actually came out of one of one of those endorsing uh, bodies. Endorsing bodies uh, <laughs> so you know the process is not necessarily. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's great for someone who who is genuinely wanting to start a business in the UK, mm -hmm. um, have good business idea. But essentially, that that's what it is. And then the, the, I guess the good thing with the innovative visa, which um, some clients seem to like, is that for the main applicant, the soonest time you can possibly become eligible for indefinitely to remain. Mm -hmm. So permanent residence is after three years. Mm -hmm. of residents in the UK um, and of course there is a list of criteria of how the business should have performed as an evaluation at the end of those three years um, but yeah so I mean this is great for experienced business executives and entrepreneurs it's, it's definitely not a passive um, investment route um, mm -hmm. there is minimum English language requirement which some some clients from certain parts of the world might find difficult but but it, it's just I mean it's, it's something that um, is available now um, and of course, uh, yeah, if, if there are other visa categories later on, then we shall see. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see. Great. Um, thank you for that. And uh, then the second part uh, is a quick uh, summary or let's say a quick update on what Rose Cut does and how we can help people um, not the money that you're going to donate or invest for your uh, residency or uh, citizenship, but the other bits of your personal wealth that requires planning and, uh, uh, and, and investing and managing on an ongoing basis. So here is what we stress about, you know, focusing on the big picture. Your net worth is your assets minus your liability and your investable assets is your net worth minus your home and emergency cash. What that means is that, for example, your assets might include your business, which is highly risky, upside, but illiquid, and uh, your uh, net worth, you know, it might include some other liquid investment with the wealth managers or other things that you do like real estate. Uh, but we help you to look at what portion is liquid versus what not liquid, so you would uh, be free from, you know, a liquidity squeeze when you move to a new country, or you can have better optimizations. Example, if you have an offshore account where uh, you can use that uh, financial investment in the offshore account as a collateral to get a loan, but loan, which is cheaper than getting the mortgage in the UK if you want to buy a property in the UK. So, you know, a lot of times we help people to set up their uh, accounts in, in a way that is a very uh, easy, um, optimal infrastructure for them to, to enable them to move to a new tax uh, residency location or to invest the money in a way that allows global mobility. You know, in the past, we've seen people who are global, globally mobile, moving country every three, five years. And now we are seeing people who are what we call glo uh, globally uh, fluid, mm -hmm. is that they were in the US last year, they come to UK this year, and next year they're off to Portugal. Yeah. So <laughs> the kind of move is accelerated in the speed and, and the scope. And for this, I think, you know, it uh, requires work on both looking after your money as well as your residency uh, uh, eligi uh, eligibility. And um, what uh, we would say are the key things before investing is that you need to outrun inflation 
and cash is no longer king, especially with inflation rate at six, seven percent or potentially passing 10 percent <laughs> later yes. this year. Uh, we need to protect you know, our, our wealth from being taxed away. If we have any left. If we have any left. <laughs> and um, second, you know, earn financial freedom. Financial freedom is defined as when you no longer have to work for money, even you can choose to. Now, this uh, may sound simple to people and people would say, okay, I have 20 million pounds and I definitely have achieved financial freedom. But as a financial advisor, I would say it depends. So if you're spending half a million a year and you're not earning, you know, more than let's say 20, 200K a year, that means you have 300K erosion on your 20 million. And you, at this speed, you know, if you're relatively young, not in your seventies, you are more likely to die penniless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or become penniless before you die, despite you have 20 million. So financial freedom is a very relative definition of how much you own, how much you uh, grow and maintain that assets uh, compared to how much you spend on an annual basis. We have clients who spend 50k a year for a family of three living in central London. I don't know how. No, I was have... say they need to give me some tips. <laughs> <laughs> and we have clients who are young and single and spend 600k a year and we ha we have to help them to budget and plan the investment on that and uh, retirement is not given it's it's earned through that and um um, if you are, especially if you are thinking of donating a piece to a program, then you need to think about, okay, what else do I have to make sure I maintain or reach my financial freedom? And uh, now, you know, we have, um, you know, volatility in the, in the financial markets due to the war, due to the you know, US Fed increasing interest rate to tackle uh, the inflation. So it's, it's a difficult environment, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean people should not invest for the long term, because this is, you know, a uh, lifelong uh, responsibility obligation if they want to maintain or achieve their financial freedom. And um, I'm curious of what are the kind of uh, questions you get from your clients on the investment side? Um, when they are thinking about uh, immigration? I think a lot of clients ask about, um, especially if they are not from UK, Europe, they would ask about, are uh, they are interested in having um, the financial advisor or an investment account somewhere mm -hmm. outside of the home region. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, I think a lot of them are under the impression that maybe that's not really possible. Is that the case? No, so I think this is what people confuse uh, retail banks with investment providers like mm -hmm. us. So retail bank is where you get um, a bank account to put cash in uh, to, you know, maybe salary or maybe support from your family to cover your daily expenses, like going out, rent a property, pay for your electricity bill. So for example, if you move from China to UK, and this is what you need to do to have a UK bank account, but you that's not that does not necessarily mean you need to move all your assets from you China to the UK because once you bring assets on shore, you are subject to the UK tax and you have investment restrictions. Depends on what it is, right? So typically, we advise clients that only bring the money is needed uh, to UK on shore. For example, your investor visa mandate. Uh, which we manage here and provide a rather flexible and good return for clients. For example, we would invest into 100% equity mm -hmm. if you are happy with the risk. And uh, typically that gets, you know, 10 to 20% return on annual basis compared to if you just put into bonds, mm -hmm. which is has performed poorly this year because of the war. And, uh, and then if you want to buy a property, um, you know, I'm sure in the UK with 1 million budget, well, as I said, you could just put down two, three hundred k as deposit mm -hmm. and get a get an offshore loan instead of a mortgage, because mortgage is more restrictive and expensive, mm -hmm. and typically requires you to have assets in the UK or have a job in the UK, which is not typically possible for some of the clients, right? So I think this is what we could really help people to strategize mm -hmm. together with the immigration consultants like you. And uh, so this is what we talk about, you know, investment with no boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, 
investment account is basically where you want a eligible um, country uh, that is typically offshore, let's say Jersey, Guernsey, in the Channel Islands or Switzerland, despite Switzerland has gone through some you know, uh, pressure in the recent years, or Luxembourg, uh, which is not typical for private clients, but for institutions, or Leicester, mm -hmm. uh, they have the infrastructure and good rules of law mm -hmm. to protect your assets. Mm -hmm. So you book your assets there mm -hmm. and give the investment right to a specialist like Rose Cut. Mm -hmm. So it's a usually a very interesting triangle. The client living country A, and the investment is booked in country B, mm -hmm. that's custodian, and your investment manager sit in country C, mm -hmm. like UK. Mm -hmm. And these three things work together and you can add your insurance citizenship on top mm -hmm. to say, okay, I want country D, like Thailand that I travel to, mm -hmm. and that should not hurt my investment booked um, uh, in country B. Mm. Uh, so this is quite a, quite a bit of a planning work people need to do, but it's worth the effort because one, you have the insurance, and second, you have the long-term planning, and the third thing, you have the investment return and, uh, and financial freedom down the road. And uh, so, you know, we're running out of time and we would just uh, quickly go through what RoseCut is about. As I mentioned, you know, we are a mobile app with a website and web app to provide accessible and safe um, private banking style uh, investments, uh, but not the Michelin star dinner come with private banks. Uh, we don't <laughs> offer that. And we offer a full suite of UK um, accounts general investment account, ISA, GISA, uh, pension, but we also mm -hmm. offer offshore account for those internationally mobile and fluid people, because that's actually the simplest way to manage your money. You have a centralized offshore place to book your main investment, and then you can hop around wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have three custodians and uh, to provide for UK, uh, Jersey, and LGT in Leicester. And uh, here are some, you know, screenshots of our app to make it super simple for you. It usually takes mm -hmm. 10 seconds to open a UK account with us and a couple of days or a couple of weeks to open the offshore account with us mm -hmm. instead of three to six months that you have to wait. And I'm a tradition say that is incredible, incredible timings. Do you have a minimum of um, investment or, yeah? You yeah, have... good question. Minimum yeah. comes with different custodians. So if you just want a UK account, that's a very modest 50,000 pounds uh, for ISA or SIP combined. Uh, we bring the minimum down to make it available for much more people than, you know, the top uh, uh, the most uh, the richest people for the power banks. If you need an offshore account, it's uh, between 100k to half a million. Mm. Uh, depends on your requirement of the custodian and uh, uh, investments. Mm. And what's more important is that usually the banks will charge you 5,000 to 10,000 to do your financial planning. Mm -hmm. We build it into a software that you can download and use for free. Mm. So this is very much using the power of technology yes. and automation to provide convenience. Mm. You don't have to plan a meeting with a consultant uh, two weeks ahead and mm. travel to central London to sit down in a beautiful office for two hours to do that. You can do this at midnight at mm. your fingertips mm. if you feel like it. Mm. <laughs> so I think that's the convenience. Mm. And a lot of our clients are the young you know, uh, aspiring and successful entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and professionals who appreciate the efficiency, yeah. the cost, the saving, then let's say the tradition, mm -hmm. uh, traditional hand uh, white glove uh, service. Mm -hmm. And for us, we really want you to focus on the long-term financial planning yes. to know why you are investing, where you are heading towards. So that's a very quick run through of Rose Cut uh, offering and uh, feel free to reach out, ask for the questions about your personal circumstances. You know, we are uh, digitally led, but we have human advisors on the other side of the Zoom screen, just like myself. So we will answer those questions. How does the human side of, of this work? Do so, they book a meeting or how, how does it work? Because it's mostly managed in the app, isn't it? 
Yeah, so very good question. So there's a process. First of all, you can download the app and create a user profile yourself. And like I said, uh, do your financial planning and you know see, okay, here's my income, here's my monthly spending, here's my assets and liabilities. How much money do I have? Uh, when do I reach financial freedom? Mm -hmm. So you might be very surprised to hear that actually at the speed of my saving and uh, investment grows, I can stop working in 10 years time. And you'd be like, okay, I want to spend more when I retire or when I have options, then that figure might go from 10 years to 15 years mm -hmm. because you want to accumulate a bigger size of uh, pot. Or you say, actually, I want to you know, spend less and be free from what I'm doing yeah. and to, to move to a different country like Thailand, you know, yeah. um, I somehow Thailand stuck in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then you can strategize your numbers in a different way. And then you are ready to move to Thailand in five years, mm -hmm. right? So we help you to do all this uh, strategy to achieve what you want to achieve financially. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you can book a call with us to realize that plan to say, okay, I need to invest my money to realize that. And I have some further questions that your app doesn't answer. Then we do a quick mm -hmm. Zoom call. Uh, 30 minutes to six minutes and then you can do digital account opening like I said uh, and then we give you remittance instructions you send the cash in our investment manager look after the money mm -hmm. so you don't have to buy and sell yourself you know you have better things to do with your life mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you can just log into the app to look at your performance mm -hmm. anytime you want you know you don't need to call your investment advisor to say send me a report to see how much my money how much return you have created it's all available on the app so a lot of the low value stuff that your investment advisor or their assistance provide we turn into a software and the important questions like you know what do i invest in and how do i plan for my future are answered by a human yeah. <laughs> uh, like that mm -hmm. um any other questions um should we see if we've received any questions from the audience at all yes we have received uh, uh, one uh, on the uh, oh, actually three on the chat to say clarify a couple of questions. Um, the do any of the residency program provide work permit in all EU countries or in certain countries uh, of application? So I think this is uh, the person is probably more asking about the European residency programs. So to answer that, if someone wants to be free and be able to live and work wherever they want in the EU, uh -huh. they need EU citizenship. Got it. Otherwise, if you have, for example, a um, Portugal Golden Residence Permit, that would allow you to live in Portugal and work in Portugal because mm -hmm. that permit itself allows it. Portugal allows it, the Spain Golden Visa or the Investor Visa allows it. But for example, Greece or Italy, some of the other countries, it's not automatic that on the basis of having that residence permit, you can work in that country. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so that's important. That's why it's always a conversation with us trying to figure out what you want to do, because even if you want to work remotely, mm -hmm. you should have the legal right to work there. But mm -hmm. of course, if, if your goal is to be, yeah, like I said, free to live and work wherever you want, mm -hmm. um, then what the person would need is EU citizenship. Got it. Uh, what's your view on the Estonia visa program? They were trying to yeah. encourage people to do the that. Digital nomad. I think Estonia comes up quite a lot when it comes to the digital nomad type of visa uh -huh. um, because we, we focus on citizenship and residence by investment. So it's something that we know of and we, you know, we, we do have an understanding of, but it's not something that we directly assist with. Sure. And second question, more details on financially independent person residency program in the EU. Were they any provide uh, yeah. whether any provide work permit in the country yeah so um may i think the person asking is is referring to the type of like maybe passive income visa so there are certain visas that that maybe it doesn't involve as big of an investment but then you know by making sure or proving that you are able to sustain yourself mm -hmm. you get a visa to live in that country so that suits some clients because then they don't need to make the investment and then as long as they say that you know i am able to support myself i have a income of x and x amount i live in portugal and maybe portugal will give you a visa 
the reason why some of our clients, even though they would be eligible for that, and that will enable them, for example, to move to Portugal, they would still make the investment to go with a um, golden residence permit mm -hmm. is because that sort of passive income visa is only going to be valid for as long as you're going to continue to live in that country. So let's say if you get that, you, you apply for that permit in, in with the Portugal example, you live in Portugal, but let's say if two, three years time, you realize that what you want to do is either to bring your business or you just want to become a resident of the UAE, you want to move to Dubai, mm. then that permit is not valid anymore, right? Mm. Um, it's the, the type of clients that, that work with us often have a longer goal, longer term goal in mind that mm. they want to achieve permanent residence or citizenship. So in the case of Portugal, um, then the clients would say, well, even though that is possible, I don't know if I'm going to be able to commit to living in Portugal for five years. It might sound like a good idea now, mm. but I don't know if that's what I want to do because life happens. Therefore, um, then the clients would say, I would rather make the investment, um, get the golden residence permit, mm -hmm. live in Portugal with it. But that will give me the flexibility of mm -hmm. that I'm not required to um, stay in Portugal because it's only on average seven days per year for the border residence permit, right? Mm -hmm. So then what they can do is to be in Portugal for two years and then decided that that's enough. And then, then they want to go to Dubai yeah. while they still keep the Portugal permit, which is then not possible with the passive income visa. I see. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, that's probably, you know, you answered the third question, mm -hmm. are there any digital nomad programs in the yeah. EU? Because I think the focus of those program, digital nomad programs or visa driven programs is to provide a immediate a temporary solution. Yeah, right? it's basically a permit for that time. Yeah, that whereas you, want to you be guys that. are more working on the long term of being able to provide people a, a, a hedge, a, a insurance yes um and the and the more sort of uh, deeper level mm -hmm. you know if my understanding is correct is yeah. that if there's a war if there is any worst case scenario like insurance another right pandemic <laughs> and then yeah. you have the chance i yeah. uh, have the flexibility yeah. right so i think this is the biggest difference between yes. visa and citizenship yeah. because visa does not give yeah. you a permanent uh, solution and i think a lot of my clients realize that having the indefinite leave to remain in the uk is not sometimes enough yeah uh, you need the if you need the full insurance you have to go for citizenship yeah. we tend to be very clear with anyone who will inquire with us like the difference between like you know the residence visa longer term residence visa investment visa permanent residence what it really means is that really permanent what do you need to do to keep that permanent residence and citizenship so it's really is a yeah it's um conversation that we have uh, the second question is do you expect something to replace the discontinued tier one investor visa so the very office. difficult to predict <laughs> as was the actual closure of the initial program um uh -huh. we we don't know for sure but i would assume that if it does come back it'll be once the world calms down a little bit and it will very much be more um business orientated less passive investment it'll actually be potentially job creation actual business ideas etc so slightly edging towards more the innovator and the old entrepreneur program but with obviously a higher amount of investment but no one knows as yet but we i would imagine that you know it, it, it created so much money for the country and was so beneficial for the country i think they'll tie up the due diligence and make it a lot, lot a lot less passive got it i uh, hope that answer your question ken uh, <laughs> so uh sorry we can't provide 100 percent uh, certainty at the moment the third question, which legal entity will hold my assets in case of EU citizens for rose card? So I think this is what uh, maybe let's restress again that your investment for EU citizens will have to be done in a way that's eligible for that particular mm -hmm. EU, EU country that yeah. you are applying for. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you want a Portugal citizenship or uh, residency yeah. and citizenship, you need to buy a Portuguese real estate yeah so which is not something rose cut will no, manage indeed. for you <laughs> <laughs> rose cut will introduce you to henley and partners and uh, they will take it from there uh, but for rose cut mm -hmm. what you might think about is okay what about my other bits of investment yes. this is where we said we could add value by giving you offshore account and make sure it does not uh, work against your 
Portuguese residency mm -hmm. and uh, invest the money mm -hmm. uh, in a good way and to protect you from the market volatility mm -hmm. and to get you very good returns. Most so, other countries require the funds, like for from a citizenship residence um, by investment perspective, they would usually require the fund to go into that country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for Portugal real estate, Portugal fund, it needs to be a Portugal bank account, for example. Yeah, so this but is very understandable, be, yeah, right? Yeah. If you need the citizenship from my country, then you make some contribution to my country. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so be prepared to, to make contribution to that mm -hmm. while, you know, still keeping your personal financial freedom in check. Mm -hmm. uh, a comment so, about the digital nomad yeah, visa. Yeah, so there is a uh, Croatia has one year digital nomad oh, visa. So this is what we're talking about. Um, yes, are there any restrictions for applicants from specific countries in Middle East for Caribbean CBI programs? So each of the um, residents by investment or citizens by investment program, um, some of them have a restricted list of countries. So on that, I would say that, I mean, we we have, uh, we keep track of that, our, mm -hmm. our team updates it regularly. So then um, what we usually start the conversation with is ask the client, what is your citizenship? What is your original nationality? And mm -hmm. we check that because there is no point to continue the conversation on a particular country. If as a citizen of, let's say Iran, you are not allowed to, um, they will not accept an application for, you know, like St. Kitts and Nevis, for example. So that's a conversation that, but it's a great question. There's, there's certain restrictions which we would guide you. Yeah. I mean, just because that program may not necessarily accept that person from the same country. We don't know where they're from. We don't know what the specific rules are on that program. However, we can always find a solution um, that there are programs available. There are some programs that are not available. If you are interested in a certain country, we can recommend yeah. a, an alternative. It's best just to get in contact with us and we will take you through, we'll understand a little bit more from you uh, and guide you as to what's available to you within your budget and requirements. Mm. Great. And uh, what are the outlined process for Caribbean citizenship by investment. This person is very yeah. specific about donation. Antigua. How does the Antigua donation process work, briefly? How does it work? Yeah. yeah so, step step. Um, well, uh, you're simply making a donation to a national development fund. So once your application is approved, that person is a fit and proper person. They've passed the due diligence that we will do before we take a penny, and the government will do uh, amongst their application process. Once you have been approved on both sides, you would make a transfer of your wealth to the National Development Fund held in said country. And there is a second question about the cost implication. So for that, um, we, uh, if you get in touch with us, we're able to provide a cost estimate based on your specific family situation. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah, the, we can't give a specific it. amount. I mean, it depends. if we're looking at, say, Antigua, we know that the donation amount would start at $100,000, but if you're a sole applicant, I know off the top of my head, total costs are around 160. If you add a couple of young kids and a wife, that's going to be about 190. But all of these programs have different nuances, and I'm just quite <laughs> sad in that I know those figures off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you're six you kids, you're going to be a family of four. You're going to be looking at 225. If you're a grenade, uh, looking at Grenada and you're a family of six, you're going to be looking around 300. All these amounts change and vary. Get in touch with us. We'll give you an exact itemized quote. Uh, we're not like other companies that kind of hide costs yes. we, we give you full itemized quote and we'll hold it to that no problem whatsoever that's great transparency and there's a person specific asking about people having second citizenship does it affect the third so you know we're does it originally the third citizenship no so i mean that. each country originally that... iranian and later turkish can can, uh, can there, are, there are rules, I mean, there are certain restrictions in terms of how long you've been out of said country, uh, where the money would be coming from to pay for the investment or the donation. Um, Iranians, there, there is there is certain restrictions, but it's not defined to all programs and it's not defined to us at all. We just have to have certain rulings and you have to have been in certain countries once you've left Iran, etc. But get in touch with get in touch with us and we'll, we'll take you through it step by step. 
yeah, generally, if your home country or, you know, it, it's, for example, if a, if a person is a Chinese national, mm -hmm. then if your home country have um, dual citizenship restriction, then of course that, that's that country's law, right? But let's say if the person is a UK national, the, the person decided to get Turkish citizenship and then they want to get a first citizenship, as long as, you know, UK doesn't have that restriction, Turkey doesn't have that restriction, then you absolutely can get multiple. A lot of our clients have several. Yeah, and, and the programs that we offer, are more than happy with multiple dual citizenship. Dual citizenship as a term effectively means multiple. Yeah. So oh, wow. uh, all of the programs <laughs> that we offer are multiple dual citizenship allowances. Yeah. Because we believe that you know with getting a, another citizenship, that is something that should add to them, yeah. isn't it? But it's it doesn't mean that you can't not revoke your last one. You absolutely yeah. can do it should you wish. I mean that's yeah. your decision, and you make those relevant plans with the relevant authorities. But what we offer, yeah, they they, they allow multiple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think China and Malaysia are the ones that don't allow dual citizenship. Yeah, India. Once or the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of countries that yeah. don't allow it. Yeah. And, yeah, but once you're off that, the then you have the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's one. So well, this person said very clear. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, and uh, the last question here is that um, someone from Nigeria uh, looking for the easiest way to migrate my family of four and have 60 to $80,000 to invest. Is there any option for that? Mm. What is the starting price? So in sort? terms of, well, I mean, 90%, I, I do a lot of work with Nigeria, but obviously I'd be happy to speak with you. However, um, the, the 95% the, the of my clients never actually relocate. But for someone looking to relocate, you're going to need to have significant, and via what we do, you're going to need to have significantly more than that, unfortunately, to get an actual, the ability to actually move. So, so as an example, the Caribbean citizenship start at $100,000. Um, EU citizenship start at around 900,000 euros. Um, but get in contact with us and we can advise you more on the options that not necessarily Henny and Partners deal with. Wow, that's great. Last question. There's someone asking, from your web database, Russian and China are the most countries high net was moved out from. Which countries do people move to, I suppose? What's the most popular destination? Um, so that always has been the UK. Mm. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. But obviously, Miss Patel, with her decision, has kind of limited that ability to do so. Um, but Australia, hugely popular at the moment with uh, the various programs that it has. And lots of obviously people are looking for Canada. Uh, it's always been typically that's where we see the vast majority of our inquiries about Canada. Um, but then it's, it's, it's EU after that. Yeah. The Chinese um, clients are very um, knowledgeable and they're very savvy with the different options. So as, as Chiuja has said early on, they go, they do go in trends and then they, they know that, you know, it, <coughs> it might be Australia, Canada, the UK, but then at some point they also look at European options. So. Yeah. That's the last question we had. And um, thank you very much for asking all sorts of questions. And uh, we really appreciate the two guest speakers today. Thank you very much for having um, us. Brought us a lot of insight. So if we can have everyone answer our uh, pool questions and uh, uh, to <coughs> let us know what you think about the webinar and what other, other things you would like to see in the future, that will be super helpful. And last thing is that the whole webinar will be recorded and released on our website and YouTube channel. So if there's anything that you want to revisit, it's always going to be there. And uh, just get in touch with us. Does that mean uh, I'm a YouTube star now? So <laughs> uh, that's the beginning of that, <laughs> yes. And uh, if you have any questions, please do get in touch and uh, we'll, we can help you uh, either on the Rosecut side or put you in touch with Henley and Partners. And uh, thank you both today. Thank you very much for thank having us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you everyone for your time. Thanks everyone. Uh, bye for now.